Now, it was not thought right to go regularly to the cinema, but we could go and see good films. And who, decided, yes. who decided who were the good films that Well, you could the parents see? decided on the reviews, etc. But there were clearly good films and not so good. But I was absolutely delighted and thrilled when Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers' films were, were dubbed as good films, because the music and dancing was superb. But we'd not go more than about once a month. That was a great treat. In those days, you had a treat. But it, it, and, and it was lovely. But my father um, had a marvelous brain, but had not had the education. And I have a great theory that parents try to give their children very much what they themselves felt they lacked. And my father's lack was formal education. So he read and read and read and gave us as much education and serious life as possible. But did, did he allow you, I mean, you've talked about the cinema, did he allow fun within the four walls of the home? Did you, were you allowed fun? And uh, were you also allowed, was it a loving household? It sounds oh, like... Very, yes, it was very much where uh, we all talked together. I think one of the things that uh, television has unfortunately done has stopped a lot of conversation and discussion between parents and children. You must remember that with your own children because those are the... The, the memories that remain. Uh, but you would have a, a children's party. We all went to parties, and they were very good, um, very good tea, very good spread laid out. You play the children's games. That was our fun. Or you went to church social occasions. When I've met your daughter Carol, she's talked about you often, and with great affection, Lady Thatcher. Was there that same affection between you and your own mother? I think we took rather a lot for granted. And I come to the conclusion that you do take too much of what your parents do for you for granted. And when you fully realize and you've had children of your own and brought them up, you just long to say thank you to your own parents for what they did for you, the sacrifices they made. Do you feel that you did that while she was alive? Did you have no, the chance I didn't, to... No, I didn't say thank you enough. And I'm sure most of us don't. Because they were very hard times. People sometimes say to me, look, you've had a hard, very busy life. I said, look, you used to see the life my mother led. She was everything. Uh, she was a very good dressmaker. She was a very good cook. She helped in the shop. She went and helped with the Methodist church. Uh, she was in the shop when my father went to be chairman of the finance committee of the council. And we never had a deficit when he was chairman of the <laughs> finance committee. Never, never. How odd that you should mention that. You were very, very close to your father. He, in a sense, it, he was unlucky enough to be voted off, and he was a very—he was a man who certainly put duty first. Yes. And effectively, he was treated not dissimilarly from yourself. I would have thought that you perceived Do it as know, such. Anyway. That occurred to me just at the time. He was an alderman, and an alderman was a senior member of the council who didn't have to get elected by the people, but the councillors put them on. And when the political complexion of our council changed to Labour. They voted my father off as an alderman. And because party politics weren't very much a part of local government in those times, many, many people were surprised and rather horrified. And I will never forget the scene which was reported in our local paper. As my father said, in honor I took up this gown. In honor I lay it down and quietly walked out. And that was very much too in my mind when uh, something unexpected happened to me. He stuck to his principles, you, I'm sure, would say that you stuck to your principles too. But isn't that why, ultimately, by, if you like, avoiding the consensus, that you and he, to an extent, had to go? It was somebody else's turn. A consensus doesn't give you really any direction in life. It's like mixing all the constituent ingredients together, but not necessarily coming out with a cake. You know. I didn't operate on consensus. But isn't consensus what on... democracy is all about? No, it is not. Democracy is quite different. Democracy is about the people being given a choice between clear policies on clear principles. So they have a lead. And they know what they're voting for. And then they choose. And so all my life I decided right from the first principles what politics was about. And Keith Joseph and I we did those principles, as it were, and uh, enlivened them up again, and policies flowed from them. So you go to the people, you don't say, look, I'm going to cons have consensus, I'm going to consult all of you. The people say, what do you believe in? What's your policy? But they want to know. Isn't You're a, a leader. For and that's what we did. Isn't that a recipe for discord? Because automatically somebody loses, because they 100% disagree with you. Yes, but if you only have consensus, as some politics in some countries go, they all get together. They then compromise every principle they've put up at the election, 
and there is no alternative choice. This came home to me very forcibly when I went to the European community one time, and some of the staff there said to me, oh, we were watching your election very interestedly, Mrs. Thatcher, and I said, but you just had an election in Belgium. Oh, they said, but there, we have an election, all the parties get together, and it's always the same old group and the same old thing. There really isn't effectively any choice. I could never have got Britain right again with all of the help which I got from my other people in the cabinet and in parliament and with the encouragement of the people, unless I'd been able to put forward a clear way ahead and why. And don't forget, we'd had a country that was practically being run by the trade unions, and the ordinary members of trade unions didn't like that either. So we didn't go for consensus, or we didn't go and say, oh, you can't put forward a clear scheme. That's too frightening. People may not agree. We went boldly for what we believed in, and it worked. Thatcherism. I mean, that's what you've really just described, an ism after your name now. Um, how would you define, I mean, I would say that you are in a perfect position now to define majorism. What no, is no, I'm majorism? In a perfect, uh, I'm in a perfect position to tell you what Thatcherism is. <laughs> but can, can you tell us, can you give a stab at what is majorism? Well, I think there are basically, let me put it this way, there are basically two ways of running the government of a country. And we, as we've had the ideological battle of the century between democracy and communism, two ways, the communism of socialism going towards communism, all the powers in the hands of the few, the government. They deprive people of freedom of worship, uh, of freedom of action, freedom to find your own job, freedom to own property. You are just pawns which they can move about. Okay. And they said that would give greater material prosperity. It didn't. It gave poverty and no dignity. And there's our much longer stream of belief. We believe passionately in the liberty of the individual, his God-given talents. There's no such thing as unfettered liberty. It must be within a rule of law. And is that majorism? That is conservative principle. And is it majorism? And it is the limited government in order to maximize the liberties of the people. And I believe it's majorism and the difference between us is one of degree. What are you going to do with all this now, Baroness Thatcher? The memoirs are complete. Um, you have, uh, you've said yourself, you have heaps of energy left. You will keep going on and on and on till the end. Um, what are you going to do with it? Where's it going to go? Will, will we ever, you've said that we won't see you back in the House of Commons unless there is some enormous world crisis of such magnitude, then you would have to come back. But where is it going to go? Fortunately, I'm invited the world over to go and say how we in fact restored the good name of Britain and the reputation for enterprise. But isn't that looking did. back? What about looking oh, forward? Oh, no, no. These things are the things which are relevant to the future. It was the socialism and communism that collapsed. Don't you understand? We won the political victory of the century. For 73 years, they lived under this terrible absolute state control without liberty. It was a free world. And who was the free world that rescued it all? Who was the free world who went and landed on the Normandy Bridges? America? Canada and Britain, the liberty-loving nations under a rule of law with the law determined by democracy. Lady Europe, going to... indeed, just look at Europe. Europe was Nazism, Karl Marx, originator of communism, came from Europe. We had fascism in Italy, we had fascism in Spain. We're marvellous in Britain. You're going to carry on spreading We've saved the, word, the world. But are you going to spend more time now with you and yours, your immediate family, your friends? I wish I could spend more time with my grandchildren, but they're in the United States. It's, 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 a, it's a great sorrow, but that, that's how life happens. Yes, we love uh, spending time with our friends, and the nicest thing, I think, is when you just ask a few people in for supper or for coffee or for drink, and you just sit and talk about the things that are affecting the world. And it is much, much more one world than ever it was in my time. That's what the change of science and communications have done. You know, you know all about China, you know all about Hong Kong, you know all about India, it's all there. We've all got the same problems, and Thatcherism is applying the world over. I have one final question for me anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. Do, <laughs> okay. do you think that, that there's been a couple of surveys out in the last few weeks which indicate that a lot of Middle England thinks that our children aren't as lucky as the children who came out of the 40s and 50s? Would you accept that? It is because I think life has changed. Home was the center of your life. We didn't have television in our sitting room, so we discussed ourselves. 
Uh, now, science and technology has made things different, and there is, I'm afraid, a much bigger breakdown of family life. And we have got to have policies to encourage the restoration of family life because it really is the most important thing in the future. And it is the most important thing morally. Lady Thatcher, thank you so much for joining us.